Welcome to the Permaculture Vine podcast, episode three. Today I have Philip Schuster, Dr. Philip Schuster with me. Uh, nice to have you on the show, Philip. Um, can you just introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, Cormac. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, I'm Philip. Uh, no formalities needed. Um, yeah, I'm a PhD in economics, basically. That's my career, if you want to say so. But I've been into permaculture for almost you know, over 12 years or so. Uh, got into it because I love nature and um, I was always interested in organic food and then I got into like urban gardening and from there somebody mentioned how they in Cuba used like little uh, beetles to fight uh, pets and I was like yeah, what's this and I was getting curious about it and that's how I stumbled over it and I pursued it became a permaculture designer and also consultant in sustainable economics so I live between nature and economics, if you want to say so, permaculture and economics. Some people say, how can you uh, combine that? Well, I guess we talk about that today a little bit. So, yeah, I'm from the economics, but into permaculture. So I'm sometimes uh, feeling more home in either side. So this is a bit where I'm coming from. And I founded Seeds for Sustainability also as a consultancy and school for sustainability. And basically for little companies, small and medium companies, and for individuals who want to become change makers or who are already change makers and they want to know more tools on how to promote change. And that's basically what we're trying to do, empower people uh, to be change makers. Yeah, that's great stuff. So let, let's take it back 12 years ago when you, when you discovered permaculture. Were sure. you gardening first or were you, was it permaculture led you to gardening or how, how, did you, how did you first discover it? Uh, I think it was on the one hand, I always was like interested in like societal uh, issues. That's why when I graduated high school, I was, I cared about social justice, always read books about like social movements, things like that. And I came over the, the social movement of urban gardens and I liked organic food by that time already from uh, having less economic uh, environmental impact. My two parents are biologists. So we had already like organic food like over 20 years ago at our family. So I was kind of into permaculture before I knew it maybe. So, but then I was into <clears throat> urban gardening and then somebody mentioned how things can be done differently, recommended some books. And that's how I found out about Zeb Holzer. Then I bought the book of Zeb Holzer and I was like, wow, this is so crazy. Uh, and this works actually. And then I, from there I got this curiosity and I, I uh, started studying uh, also online back in the days uh, is a permaculture course in Nashville in the US and it was super cool uh, because for me it was super uh, fine for me because I could really be where I am in my little garden and learn online with the teacher and was guided and it worked for me pretty well. So that's how I, I got into it basically. So you done your, is that your PDC you did in, in Nashville online? No, that was that a... the PDC, the PDC, you know, the, not the PhD. Ah, it's PDC. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the PhD ah. then actually I did in Germany uh, at the university. Though, no, so I was after after I actually graduated from university, then I finalized my permaculture studies. Basically, well, finalized. You can never stop learning permaculture. I assume it's so dynamic. And um, yeah, so that's how I how I got into it. No, I was so amazed by the fact that plants can work together. That uh, you can fight pests with maybe other. Uh, insects and i was like wow that is so cool for the environment and for the economy even you know because i always had like this overall uh, viewpoint not necessarily for my own garden you know my my viewpoint and still on permaculture is more also the societal effect maybe it can have and also when we talk about disaster control and all these kind of things that we need to talk about when we talk about permaculture design i mean it has its origins in agriculture but for me i always saw it like as the top uh, achievement you can be in sustainability like what if you talk about sustainability and you talk about real sustainability i realize that's permaculture you know, inspired by nature so the ideal thing is 100 percent biological cycles biological technology if you want to say so and i was like okay if we want to design a perfect society uh, then in a fully sustainable society then permaculture should be the way and that was my entry point more or less from the sustainability point of view i was like amazed how far you can go and what can be done uh, based on nature solutions really 
and 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 because I'm an economist more from a macroeconomic point of view, I didn't study business administration. I studied more like the general view on economics and how to improve societies, if you want to say so, and also solve social issues, environmental issues, and permaculture seems like the answer to so many questions. You no, know, from not my own garden, but then you see how food is produced. You know, maybe I'm li I was living in the city at that t point of time, so I wasn't really having so much space to garden. You know? But then I was aware of the fact how unhealthy the food system was. I was dumpster diving by that time too because I didn't like the fact that food is thrown away. It's not because I needed to uh, get food that was thrown away, not from an economic point of view, but I was just so, from an ethical point of view so upset by the fact that so much food is wasted. You know, there's this one documentary that I, I don't know when I watched it, but I, there was a movie in the cinema I watched. It was a documentary from Austria called Taste the Waste. Uh, maybe you've heard about it. And it, I was there was one number in there that was shocked me. It was 10 years, more than 10 years ago. And it said, by the what is thrown away in food, which is still edible by the US and Europe together, you could feed the world three times. I was like, wow. That can't be, you know? And I was like, why is that so crazy? You know? And then I was thinking of all these things that you think of European Union, the trade union, the WTO, World Trade Union, and, and all these things um, where you realize that the economic system is just fully designed, you know, fully, with flaws. And permaculture, again, has answers to questions. Not all of them, maybe. Uh, it depends on how you solve it, but... Basically, that's that's my my entry point into permaculture you know, from a societal point of view, more than maybe from my own garden, you know. Yeah, that's that came <laughs> later. That came later then. Yeah, no, that's good to hear because uh, most people you chat to, well, I've chatted to anyway, permaculture. They start in the garden and then they work out towards that. So you, you've actually started from a societal point of view and worked in, which is which is quite good. Uh, it's a, it's a good uh, perspective on things, and then. So after you do your PDC and you 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 how do you do you uh get in so you you uh, you're a founder of Seeds for Sustainability, so how how does the end of that come? Do you actually start uh, starting a business within the, yes. the space of sustainability and permaculture and? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it was like coincidence in life, maybe you would say so. Uh, I was working at the university at that time, um, and I realized I don't want to stay at the university. Not because I didn't like the university, but this civil servant career perspective where you have like very rigid work hours, very rigid work time and the ethics, the work ethics are quite hierarchical. And um, so I was like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to stay here. Uh, it's not my, my perspective for my future working, so, but I wanted to finish my PhD. So I was like, okay, but at the time I was feeling I need to find out what I want. I don't want to call it a midlife crisis because I wasn't so old by that time. <laughs> but it was kind of like maybe looking for purpose, if you want to say so. So I said, hey, uh, let me just do what I love. And then from there, find out what I want to do, really. And I took my surfboard and said, okay, let me just travel a little bit and go surfing. That's the truth. And then I, I met a friend of mine when I was living on an island in Germany and then giving a surf lesson together. And then all of a sudden, we were talking about nature and permaculture and because i was already into permaculture and he seemed to be quite interested and then i was like hey why don't we found a surf camp with and have a permaculture garden there? and i'm like hey that's a cool idea so which i didn't do at the end no but that was basically the beginning of the journey then we traveled to the north of spain looking for land and when we have a good wave with good land didn't find it he went to australia i stranded then uh, after some other stops on gran canaria looking for a permaculture project where I could go surfing. And then I was like, okay, while I'm there, I may be looking for some land uh, next to a nice wave and start the business as a surf hostel um, with permaculture. So I didn't find the land there that I really thought that's like Costa Rica where you're at the hammer, chilling on the beach and having a nice paradise in front of you because it's quite urban here, the coast. So I didn't really find the spot where I think that's fit for a permaculture and surf hostel. But I stayed into permaculture and I then finished my PhD and then I was been thinking like, okay, um, and I got into teaching because I was teaching German at that point of time to survive basically. Uh, just going around and helping people with their homeworks. I found out people needed to learn German here in Gran Canaria because of the German tourists that come here. And I was like, okay, people want to learn German. Okay, I can speak that. I can help you. So that was my first entry into a business because in my family, 
no one was really a businessman. I come from a teacher family, academics, not into and, and, and civil servants or private industry, private business was not nothing common in my family where I could have learned from. And uh, so I was all of a sudden uh, forced to be a teacher. And I always said, I don't never want to be a teacher because my parents are both teachers. <laughs> I'm not going to become a teacher, but look, there I am. Um, so it's quite a funny there by all just teacher when I thought I, I never want to do anything with biology and look now I'm teaching economics with biology bioeconomics and it's like okay so the apple doesn't fall so far from the stem finally it appears so so then I realized okay uh, here in Spain to make a living it's good if you have some kind of entrepreneurship so I had to start to be freelancing and I've, when I then came back to Germany and I handed in my PhD thesis to defend it one of my new colleagues there at the institute was saying to me, hey, what, are you teaching German? Oh, cool. But with your PhD, you could t teach economics. And I was like, yeah, I don't know, but in Spain, it's a bit difficult to find a job. Yeah, but why don't you teach online? I'm like, huh? What are you saying? It was over 10 years ago, not teaching online. What's that, you know? So, yeah, there's online tutors for teaching economics. And I was like, okay, let me look. So I went into one of the social media networks, looked for online tutor in economics and actually found my first job. Back in the days in economics. And from there, I was like, hey, that is cool. Online working, online teaching. Um, and then I, I was uh, back in Gran Canaria and I connected with the university. And I was like, hey, why can't I do on a university level e European projects that are funded by the EU and I can do sustainability work, but still be in the university, but not as a civil servant doing business. So that's where I then started to collaborate with the university. And we... I applied for funding with the EU project and the second round we got the funding and this all of a sudden I was like, okay, giving consulting and, and courses to SME companies, basically small and medium enterprises. And I realized, hey, uh, because also the EU identified a gap in uh, skills in, in, in companies in sustainability, basically. So there's lots of training needed and still. So it's like, hey, that's a niche, a market niche, maybe not even a niche, it's a big market where I can really say, I can have a business with purpose because this is what I want to do, but I never found anybody that says, I'm willing to pay you for what you do. You have to teach typical economics. And I was like, nah, I don't want to do that. Um, so I never was really happy with what I was teaching at the university. You know? And then I realized it doesn't have to be that way. There's economics that go in, even in line with permaculture because then I found out about the economy for the common good. I was like, hey, that, what is this? And this, this is the balance sheet where you actually value or the impact on your company um, on values like for the human dignity, solidarity, ecological sustainability and transparency. So, and democracy, you know, so those are the values that we want to promote as a business, for example, it's a common good. And then you look at the stakeholders and you have some kind of indicators you would measure. And all of a sudden I saw, Hey, this is where permaculture fits in permanently. And all of a sudden I was like, Hey, economics and permaculture is not contrary. It can go together. And all of a sudden I was like, Hey, I don't have to feel bad. And now all of a sudden I can stay in economics, what I learned, but pursue what I love, which is sustainability and nature and farming and permaculture. And all of a sudden I saw, hey, it's possible. So I pursued this economy for the common good more to have like a purpose in my economic life, if you want to say so. And I always thought there must be a way to bring in permaculture more and more. But up until recently, I really haven't found a way how to sell permaculture, if you want to say sell, you know, sell permaculture to a broader audience. But now, new terms emerged that became very trendy, like circular economy or nature-based solutions, regenerative economics or regeneration. All of a sudden, we can talk about permaculture without maybe having to say permaculture, but do permaculture. And that brings us a big advantage because, unfortunately, that's one of my experiences, permaculture has some connotations in the business world that are not necessarily positive. It's, it's a bit unfortunate. And not really taking serious, but now with these new terminologies and seeing that they're doing basically the same thing as what well, we can do, but we can do it a bit better even with permaculture design. Uh, we have open doors to talk to municipalities, governments, businesses, and all of a sudden, permaculture becomes, um, I don't know if you want to say, be mass compatible. It sounds a bit strange. Maybe we don't want to become, maybe I'm upsetting many people that are listening to now. It's like, <laughs> what permaculture? Mass compatible. <laughs> Who's this Philip? I'm going to visit him and cut it's, his head off. It's mine. It's all mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. but seriously, for me, uh, um, you know, when you think of permaculture, many people associate like, yeah, self sufficiency. I'm going to move to my land, live off the land, and forget about everything. Society, screw off. I'm off, you know. Um, 
But I don't think that's the solution. First, there's not enough land for all the people on the planet to have their own little farm and live in self-sufficiency. That's one. Um, it's un unrealistic as a scenario thinking of worldwide. Maybe we in the, f in the industrialized world, we have the privilege. We can maybe afford that. But worldwide thinking globally with all the billions of inhabitants, it's quite unlikely. So we need solutions that are other than I'm living on my farm and doing permaculture. That's not going to save the world. Maybe I'm upsetting somebody again, but I think that's <laughs> reality. And there's another trend. So many people moving into cities. It's not that this trend is stopping anytime soon. To the contrary, it's accelerating. So more and more people will live in the city of the world population. So we have to find a lot of solutions for the city. And that's another area where I'm so excited about permaculture and cities. You know, how to re-nature cities, how to use yeah, the space that we have already. And how to make them more sustainable, no? Because the reality is, we like I was repeat, we can everybody can move on a farm or even can't afford to live on the land and, and things like that, even job wise or whatever it is. Uh, not I don't think, I don't, think chance, no? I don't think everybody wants to either. Exactly. Um, but I, I think yeah, the, the solutions are there. And what I found surprising uh, was in the permaculture movement, the damn restrictions you talk about is like you can't. Like you're not allowed to speak about this stuff, but I always go back to well, you have to. It's in the it's in the principles. You have to, you have to create a yield, and exactly. then a yield is profit, and then you can use that profit for the greater good. And also, exactly. chapter fourteen of, of Bill Mawson's manual, permaculture manual, talks about economies, and exactly. maybe that's out of date now. But if you bring in, uh, if you bring in the the circular economy under that, well, that's to me, that's, that's that's like the modern equivalent of what he talked about. So to me, it's it is it is essential that we uh, put permaculture up as a solution to all these problems because the solutions are there, and even applying the the method of design to your own life, it just doesn't have to be in the garden. It can be outside, and I think it's great that it can be applied to economics. But it's just it's uh, but I always think it's about uh, matching up that language of corporate speak. Yes. and the EU and, and the US and all this government and, and pre, pre, trying to present permaculture as a solution to these things mm -hmm. because it's proven to work it's, it's exactly. demonstrated so, like the other day uh, when I was uh, giving a, a little speech I, I showed them a website it's called nature, naturebasedsolutions.org and we think like okay that sounds cool and, and who's behind that website it's even with others the World Bank and you're like wow that's the, that's evil, you know. Maybe you might think that evil because if you enter into economics and what happened to the world, economics basically order what happened to the developing countries, and you think of the World Bank and the monetary fund, you're like, mm, okay. And now they're promoting nature-based solutions. That sounds sketchy to me. That one association I have, but on the other hand, I'm trying to think positive and thinking, okay, it's also a great opportunity because all of a sudden they're using this vocabulary, and then you go on their website and you see urban wetlands, you see grey water recycling, you see stuff for draft control and uh, wetland restorations, river restorations, nature, and it's like, man, that's permaculture, you know? And it's by the World Bank, so hey, um, that's why I, I don't like demonizing that maybe when I was younger and more the, on the revolutionary side of permaculture movement and going dumpster diving, which was illegal by the day, and we still did it, and I was like, okay, yeah, but just because I believe in it, um, but this anti-systematic approach for me is it's not good because it's not positive. Uh, it's not constructive. If it's not constructive, it can't be good. That's a bit my energy. Uh, and so I'm thinking of solutions that can align both sides. And that's for me a great sign. Now that I now can use the vocabulary of nature-based solution and then show a permaculture design and then talk about permaculture. But the entry door was maybe even circular economy. Like the other day I did a conference on ESG, which is also, and McCormick and me knows it's a bit of an insider <laughs> joke. Uh, it's like yeah. evil corporate environmental social governance. So people, it's again, associate, and it is misused. I, I agree. Uh, and there's lots of greenwashing, and that's one of the biggest issues we maybe have now in sustainability that everybody's now claiming we're green and that so, so not. And even with circular economy, it can be completely circular, you know, and you produce basketballs in the prison, for example. Uh, could be circular, but it's completely unethical. No? So circular doesn't mean ethical. So again, uh, the discussion is never over. No, but demonizing, 
is not a good thing. So I g gave this uh, speech on ESG, and I, I, it was about where nature meets technology. And I, and I call it the edge effect, like edge and permaculture, talking about permaculture, ecology, inspired by ecology, bringing them the idea to we can't be so far away from nature, telling them the positive side of technology, but where the limits are of technology, then maybe how we can align that with nature. Because we, why do we have to always say, here's nature, there's technology, and they can be together, some things, for example. And also, again, division. Division is not good. Even in, uh, we say rather integrate than segregate. It's another principle in permaculture. So now, again, why should we exclude people like from the financial markets, for example, and say, no, we don't want anything to do with you, you're evil capital. But again, it's segregation. So again, if everybody who's against everything in permaculture movement, please think about the principle integrate rather than segregate because <laughs> you're not doing it. And I hate this hate speech, really. And um, it doesn't bring us forward. No, but for me, it was a chance. And I also showed the website of naturebasedsolutions.org. And then I talked about permaculture on an ESG financial market conference. Before it was never possible, but all of a sudden, because I talk about ESG, people are like, aha, he talks about business. But then he talks about circular economy, aha, okay. Then I talk about all this EU stuff that's going on, and they listen, aha, okay, that's serious. Then nature based solutions, and then all of a sudden, I talk about permaculture, wetlands, organic farming, regenerative farming, and all of a sudden, people listen, you know? So I think it's a good approach to, to, to not be against stuff, but rather think, how can we do things together, you know? I mean, at least it's. Many times it's possible, and uh... no, I th I think that's great because you're 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 adding solutions. You're not you're not shying away from the, the conversation, and if you're not if you're not having the conversation, you can't bring forward your solutions. You can only complain from the outside. But it's it's crazy, like uh, because I only discovered this language if you like uh a few months ago when I I basically messaged out people in LinkedIn who I knew worked in companies and sort of says, look, I'm I'm doing permaculture designs. I'm trying to get into the the sort of the corporate side of it, mm -hmm. if businesses were interested, and then they said, "I go to your ESG director," and I said, "What's this ESG CSR? <laughs> what is it?" And then you find out, and that's how I found your site, Seats for Sustainability. I was like, "Oh, this, uh, this is quite a good site." Uh, so it's just learning that language. So um, I'm I'm doing the course, the minute your course, the ESG expert. It's a, it's a great course. Uh, so just learning about these things, the donut economy. And it's, it's nice to learn this language. It's like a, a language I never, I never thought it would be studying it, to be honest. I've never heard of it. <laughs> yeah. To see, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's how, how I felt then when I found the first time about like this is coming good economy and then hearing all these new terminologies. And I was really surprised that uh, not everything is evil that comes from economics. <laughs> no, but uh, talking about economics, you know, like if you really go in, like you mentioned Bill Mollison, and that's what I always think, say to read Bill Mollison and, and please underline the, word, uh, the, the, the sentences where he means, when he mentions the word money or, or monetary value of something, you know, he always talks about, hey, you can do this and save such amount of dollars. You do this and you can raise such amount of fish that give you such amount of money every month. He's talking economics, no? And um, the word economics, and that's another friend always talks, when she talks about permaculture, she always puts that first. And I, and I think it's quite smart to say, you know, oikonomia, like economics comes from the oikonomia, and it means the, the management of the house. It's a Greek word, not oikonomia, how to manage your house. Hey, that's zone one in permaculture. E economics starts at the home and you can apply everything. And, and, and there's no sustainable economics or economy without sustainable homes. So now when we talk about sustainability on a microeconomic level, Where's the impact created? Private consumption, of course, corporate evil, of course, but they only produce what we buy every day. And if we keep buying, keep buying, keep buying, they produce and produce and produce. So uh, we can't just blame the corporate world, you know? It's a bit short-sighted. So we think we have to start in our own economy, which is our home. And permaculture is all about that, how to make your home business more sustainable. And it can start from having your own garden. Or if you don't have a garden, Try to reduce your waste with zero waste strategies. You're living in the city. You can do all kinds of ways how to do permaculture. You can think of, okay, where do I spend my money to? Do I give it to a big corporation or do I buy my fruit basket at the local corner store and promote uh, and buy from a local business or even better, maybe I find a permaculture fruit shop or cooperative where I can buy from, etc. So you make your decision with your wallet as well. And that's also permaculture and it's pure economics in the end. So... 
Um, that's why I never understood really what what why is such a fuss about ah oh, you're an economist what you have to do with permaculture you know how many times I heard that like how come and I'm like hey okay let me explain to you you know but yeah, but yeah like I said recently it's becoming easier and easier and that's why I'm so happy about this whole regenerative movement basically yeah it's it's good that uh, uh, it's been talked about more and it's it's um... As you say, it's provided us a language now we can communicate with these corporations that they understand and they have people inside. So you want to tell us about uh, how did Seeds for Sustainability start and how did you, uh, what services you offer and, and how you get into that that space? Yeah, Seeds for Sustainability, like after this EU project that I mentioned earlier, I realized, okay, that's what I want to do. I want to have a training company for SMEs, basically, you know, to teach small businesses and companies and employees and individuals basically about sustainability permaculture the common good co2 footprint measurement circular economy those were like the topics that i i liked you know? and so i found a seeds for sustainability and yeah and the name uh for me has some um yeah you, you can call it spiritual uh, meaning you no know? like the seeds we sow as it's written in the Bible, has a bit of meaning, and that's where I quoted also a Bible verse, and that's in that aspect. Because for me, it's really how it is. Now, the seed we sow can either bring good or bad fruit, depending on the ground you sow it into. So we have to act, uh, look on two sides: which seed are we sowing, and which what, what ground are we sowing it into? No. And so, if I have a bad seed, which is just segregation, for example, it's not what I'm sowing. Not sowing sustainability. I'm not sowing the good thing. No? So for me, it's what do we sow every day? That's where the name is coming from. So we want to help companies and individuals with not everything they do, no, but to start sowing the right seed every day, no, and having this as a if you want like a continuous process, like kaizen, no, from Japanese it's a steady improvement philosophy. So sustainability is maybe not necessarily something that you it's a state where you go to, but it's like a more like a process that is continuous and. The seed you sow matters, no? So doing a course of sustainability makes you already more sustainable because we also plant a tree for you and we train your people and so on. So now this is the idea, no? Of, and of saying, okay, instead of uh, mindless, mindlessly uh, using whatever, coffee capsules in the coffee machine, thinking about, is that a good cap? Is it a good way to produce a coffee in a plastic capsule? And, 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 and Or thinking, okay, well, how can, it, on a corporate level, how can we improve these kind of things? No? And, that's why seeds, no? it, it matters the seed we sow. But like I said, it matters as well the ground we sow it into. So sometimes you have ground that is already very fertile for a permaculture seed. But sometimes it's not. So I have to work the ground. No? Or, or I mulch the ground, yeah? depending <laughs> on the technique we're using. Yeah? You have, but I prepare you have a fan of somebody else now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to upset anybody. I'm not telling. I'm talking about preparing the land or the ground. Uh. Not necessarily uh. breaking it up. <laughs> Sometimes you do have to break it up, uh, yeah. but I'm saying it, it means awareness raising many times too, or like I'm saying, let's start using this vocabulary so we have a more easy transition and talk to people that are now also forced to talk about sustainability, like in the mayor office, they all have pressure from Europe to work on the sustainable development goals. You can think about them what you want. If they are greenwashed, yes. Can I use them in a good way? Yes. So it, they are there, not the sustainable development goals. Another terminology, you talk to a, a mayor's office, any politician, they know them. It doesn't matter if you 100% would sign them off, you know, but you have an open ear and then you can say, hey, we can work on this SDG, whatever, life on land, biodiversity with that kind of techniques. And all of a sudden they're like, ah, okay, now I'm, now I'm listening. You know? This is groundbreaking stuff. You have to do that first. You know? and many times... Um, we move ourselves in our own communities and everybody's already pro-sustainability so we don't feel like we have to do that. No, But I think if we want to make it mass compatible uh, and, and achieve the big MP that we need to achieve, we need to go that way. You know? um, break grounds and uh, prepare the soil for, for the good seed. That's how the name came up and that's the philosophy of the company. And now the second question is what services do we offer? Yeah, So we offer like trainings, uh, consultings for companies. We also have our little club that started as an alumni club because I was always a bit sad when the courses were over and then the students leave and I was like, let's create something more permanent yeah, so that people can feel like, hey, I belong to the community of Seeds for or I stay with because I want to 
also people feel like with seeds for sustainability we do something together maybe no and at least it's my my wish no and so i created this club and then i realized hey this could be a good way also to have another business idea basically no i have like a more of maybe a subscription based business model on or more affordable for people that way too uh, because i'm also into e-commerce and i was teaching e-commerce at universities and seeing how successful these business models are where people subscribe to something. I mean, how, how many of the listeners have anything to subscribe, whether it's Netflix or whether it's Spotify or YouTube or anything. We all have our Zoom Pro uh, account, yeah, for example. Uh, all this kind of stuff uh, we subscribe to. And uh, it is also a way to make products more sustainable, like talking about products and services. Um, so that's also what I think uh, when, I, when, I, when I talk about the digital business. And so we have this club where we also have like events going on and like extra materials and things like that. And where I want to really create like a community and a way where like, let's say a company can get like coaching within this club basically and not having to pay an expensive consultant, but having more like somebody that they can call like a hotline. Hey, Philip, I'm doing this strategy right now about sustainability or I'm calculating my footprint. Can you help me? Like they're like a hotline, like how you would call your tax accountant when you have a problem and they solve your solution, then you give you a solution. That's more or less what we want to do within this uh, club, providing regenerative solutions and ideally extend it not to helping also farmers and, and things like that. But also we, we're doing like project ma project management. Well, I'm still uh, involved into like getting fundings from the EU and then managing these kind of funds because there's lots of possibilities to do uh, circular economy, nature-based solutions, all this vocabulary that I've just mentioned. I can help us also to get funding for what we're doing because the EU has the European Green New Deal that you might have heard about. And they say they have such amount of billions of euros that go into this circular economy. And you ask yourself, well, how, how, you know, it's not just directly subsidizing companies, but it's having created this, it's called also the Next Generation Fund from the EU, where all kinds of tenders for all kinds of universities, technology research, but also for social projects, you know, and there's lots of funds out there that we can reach in a way um, with other collaborations, with NGOs, but it's a matter of finding suitable partners where you are and, and look where the next call is in the area that could be of yours. And maybe with some effort putting in, uh, you get funding for the next couple of years for the project you're doing. You know? So this is also what we, what we do, being involved in this uh, funding world in a bit yeah, and, and participating in projects and proposals but also running uh, projects. So uh, I can really recommend to go in there, even though it's maybe stressful and it can be frustrating because maybe you apply to a project and you don't get the funding and you're like, nah, no, I invested so many hours and I don't get a cent out of it. But if you think like that, then it's maybe not the right thing for you, you know? because it's also a seed you sow. Uh, it's an investment in a way because I can definitely say that big part of the network that I'm now working with are from the proposals that have been written or been involved in in the last couple of years, not just the project that were successful, but also others. So you're always creating some kind of network, your ecosystem in a way. And um, yeah, I can also just really recommend people that are starting up and then they're into sustainability and they may be struggling with fu funding their activities no? because it's sometimes like that. And now there's access to third-party funding basically and it's a good way to look out there. It's not easy, but um, sometimes uh, you're lucky, you know, and maybe a new journey starts. Yeah, that's uh, something we're going to look on there as well for, for ourselves. They, um, they look on there, it's a, it's a minefield. <laughs> it's very difficult to read all that. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the I know. Reams of documents. It's a, I think you, you need a, a certain uh, type of focus for that. Uh Blaib, thanks very much for coming on. It's been great. Uh, do you want You're to tell welcome. people where they can find you online? Sure. You can uh, look for seats minus four minus sustainability.com. Oh, I don't know how you pronounce that correctly in English, not with the uh, sidebar. Or you, um, yeah, you can find us on LinkedIn. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram with seats for sustainability. And yeah, I'd be happy to welcome everybody in the club. So because the basic version of the club is uh, free and you have access to a couple of resources already, you can uh, sit together with me for the first time and you can have access to our webinars and stuff like that. So just come by and join our Changemaker community. 
Yeah, and I, I can vouch for it. It's a good community to be part of. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh. let's keep sowing the good promo cushion seeds and see you all in the future. That's great. Thanks very much. See you later. Bye. Na 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 na